Today's scripture is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. I'll read verses 1 through 10. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the true forms of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually year after year, make perfect those who approach. Otherwise, would they not have been offered, since the worshippers cleansed once for all, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have, been pre- yeah. but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, see God, I have come to do your will, O God. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken any pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, see, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for and for all. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O guys. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Kella. Thank you, Lynn. And I want to thank everyone else who contributes to make our services so wonderful and such a wonderful worship experience. Um, I also want to thank each of you for hanging in there in this sermon series title questions I've always wanted to ask God. We are in the fifth week of this sermon series. Can you imagine? Fifth week. We've actually taken a look at uh, how to fit God into our busy lives today. And what does it mean to be saved? What does faith have to do with it? And last week, we asked the, God the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Today, we are asking God, why did Jesus die on a cross? Why did Jesus die on a cross? And before I continue, I want to ask um, each of you, have you even thought about these questions before? Have you asked these questions of yourselves before? Maybe that last one, right? Why do bad things happen to good? That's probably the only one. And, but even if you've never asked this question or you, um, that we've looked at or will be covering in the upcoming weeks, it's okay. But now that you've been exposed to these questions, my hope and my prayer is that each of you would wrestle with, engage with those questions. Because how we think about, how we process, how we understand, and more importantly, how we answer these questions for ourselves will determine how our relationship with God will look. So it's important to take time to think through, to think deeply about your relationship with God to ask ourselves those tough questions, to find answers that make sense to you, that you can believe in and you can live by. Because if you don't do that, you'll be like the man who went to church and felt that God spoke to him and he felt God telling him to make changes in his lifestyle. And one of those changes was for him to change or to lose weight to change um, that part of his life, right? So he decided to go on a diet. And as, as I say that, each of you can understand that. I think we've all tried to diet sometime in our, our life, right? Um, and then how many of you have ever tried dieting and, and weren't so successful? <laughs> right, right. So we, so we can all understand this. But, but this guy had a plan, He found an accountability partner. He identified things in his life that was contributing to his weight gain. And one of those things he identified was every morning as he drove to work on the route that he drove to work was a Dunkin' Donuts. So he stopped off at Dunkin' Donuts to get his coffee and his donut every morning. And he identified that. He recognized that wasn't good for him. So he actually changed his route. And for several weeks, he was doing really, really well. He lost some weight. He was feeling energetic. But one morning, he showed up to work with a box of donuts. So his accountability partner asked him, um, where'd you get the donuts from? It said Dunkin' Donuts. Obviously, he went to 
Dunkin' Donuts to get the donuts. And he said, you know, I got the donuts um, this morning because because God told me get, to get the donuts. And his accountability partner was, really? And he said, yeah. You know, this morning I had to go to the, the post office, so I had to drive my normal route before coming to work. And the normal route has the Dunkin' Donuts. And then I started thinking about those chocolate glazed donuts, and, and, and I really felt God wanted me to have one. And his accountability partner just started shaking his head. He said, no, 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 really. So I, I prayed and I asked God, God, if you want me to have a donut this morning, you're going to open up a parking stall right in front of the doors. So his accountability partner asked, so obviously God opened up a parking stall. He said, yeah, I only had to drive around nine times. <laughs> See, if we don't, we don't wrestle with the questions, if, if we don't find answers, for, if we don't have convictions to live by, we're going to be like the Dunkin' Donut man, which is the perfect segue to our text for this morning. Um, Linda, can you please drop the screen for us this morning? I, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, as, as Christian read so well for us. But it, as I was listening him, to him read the text, it, I, I, I felt it. Did you guys feel it? It was kind of disjointed, right? I wish, I really wish we had the time to read through the whole book of Hebrews. It wasn't j- disjointed because he doesn't know how to read. It was the text was taken out of context, so it's, you know, it's not familiar to us. Um, and the reason why I, I wish we had the time to read through the book of Hebrews is the book of Hebrews explains exactly why Jesus is the better sacrifice, that Jesus is the better priest, that Jesus was the better plan, okay? And if you're not familiar with the book of Hebrews or any of the other books in our Bible, my recommendation to you, my suggestion is that when you go home today, read Hebrews chapter 1. And if you have the time, read through the whole text because that's usually um, when you can grasp the whole story at one sitting. But if you can't, tomorrow, read Hebrews chapter 2. And any other stories within the Bible... See, the reason why I'm encouraging you to make it a goal to become familiar with the Bible and the scriptures is because when we read the Bible, we engage with God. We humble ourselves before him, and he speaks to us. And knowing God is vital to our relationship with him. And for those of us new to Christianity or unfamiliar with the Hebrews and their story, you know, I want to share a quote that succinctly summarizes the book of Hebrews for us. And it is by the late Dr. Walter Martin, founder of the Christian Research Institute. And the quote, his quote is, The book of Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Yeah. And the reason the author of Hebrews was telling other Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews, he was speaking to Christian Hebrews, by the way, is that many of the early Jewish, many of the early Hebrew Christians were slipping back. They were falling back into the ritualistic practices of Judaism. They were following the rules and the rituals and the regulations of being Hebrew. What rules? Well, like the Ten Commandments. And the dietary laws, which, which meant that no Kahlua pig for them, no Portuguese sausage, no sashimi. They're also following the sacrificial laws again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And why in the world would the Hebrew Christians revert back to their old ways, to their old lifestyle? Well, to escape the growing persecution against Christians by the Roman Empire. So the heat was turned up. We've never experienced anything like that within our contemporary culture. We're getting some of that in our, our, our legal system, okay? but not, nothing like this where we would lose our lives for our faith. So they were trying to escape the growing persecution against the Christians. So this letter was written to encourage those being persecuted for their faith to continue in the grace 
of Jesus Christ and not turn back to their old ways. So now that we have a better uh, sense of what's going on, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, okay, to learn why Jesus, the Son of God, died on our cross for our sins. And while preparing for, for our, my sermon today, I found another translation of the text uh, to give us a better perspective of what's going on. So I'm going to walk us through verse 1 to 4 from the Message Bible, from the Message Bible, which I'm going to project on the screen for us. But please, please follow along in your NRSV and compare the text, um, which raises a question that was asked, oh, what version of the Bible should I read? And my answer to you is read the version that you understand. Okay, when you're reading the Bible, don't torture yourself by trying to read a, a version like the old King James where, where all the these and that. But if... You understand all the these and thous? More power to you. Praise be the Lord. Read the version of the Bible that you understand. Make sense? Okay. So now we're going to take a look at Hebrews 10 to learn why Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for us. Okay. Starting in verse 1. So the old plan... Okay, the old plan was only a hint of the good things in the new plan. Since the old law plan wasn't complete in itself, it couldn't complete those who followed it. So what is the author talking about here? What was the old plan? Anybody? Shout it out. What's the old plan? The sacrifices, the law. The old plan was the Mosaic law, also known as the Torah. It was part of the first covenant. The first, for lack of better terms, contract, a binding contract between God and the Hebrews where God promised to bless the Hebrews if they followed him with all of their hearts. See, but there was a problem with that old plan. And the problem was that all human beings are born with an incurable disease. Every single one of us are born with this disease, and that disease is called sin and a sin nature. And we have this propensity to sin. Yup, everyone look at your neighbor. Don't tell them that they're a sinner, but look at your neighbor. Look at those around you. Every single one of us. I, I will be the, the first to admit. Yeah. I, yeah. Every single one of us has this incurable disease. And the problem is intensified by the fact that sin separates us from God. So God, being the loving father that he is, provided a temporary solution through the Mosaic law for us. And the Mosaic law worked so well at the time that it actually distinguished the Hebrews from all the other nations, all the other people groups of that era. But notice, notice that the old plan, the old law was only a hint It was a shadow. It's a preview of the good thing to come. And that good thing was Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. He was the perfect sacrifice. Back to the text. Okay? So no matter how many sacrifices were offered year after year, they, the sacrifices, never added up to a complete solution. If they had, the worshipers would have gone merrily on their way, no longer dragged down by their sins. Because you see, in God's plan, animal sacrifices were never intended to sanctify, never intended to purify the Hebrews of their sins. In fact, sacrifices weren't even God's idea. No. No. Animal sacrifices, human sacrifices were already a normal part of antiquity. So God didn't invent sacrifices. God used what was already in place to accomplish what needed to be done. The need to cleanse his children of their sins. Every parent understands this. Every one of us understands this. As we, when we were children... When we were toddlers and we tried to feed ourselves, what happened? We got messy, right? 
Didn't your, if you had children and the children were toddlers, two years old, they're learning how to eat, didn't they have food all over themselves? Yeah, they did. We all did. We just don't remember it, but we did. Imagine your child finishing lunch with curry or beef stew or spaghetti and having all of that all over them, okay? And they go run off to the living room couch, which is pristine white. Would that happen? No! You wouldn't allow that. Why not? Because they're dirty. You would clean them up first. Same thing with God. God loves us as his children, but when we get dirty with sin, we need to be cleaned, cleansed, covered. Okay? So our challenge, our challenge is that we're so removed from the text as we sit here in our air-conditioned sanctuary, and believe me, I like air conditioning. So there's, I'm not speaking against air conditioning. It's difficult for us to imagine what it was like back then, how bloody it was. So let me give you a glimpse of, of what normal constituted for their Hebrew lives, okay? The priests would offer up daily sacrifices consisting of two lambs, one offering in the morning, one in the afternoon, okay? On the Sabbaths, the priests would sacrifice two additional lambs. So two lambs, 365 days a year, how many lambs is that? 730, okay? An additional two lambs, 52 weeks, right? So another 110 lambs. So what are, what are we looking at? 840-something lambs so far, okay? Now every new moon, okay, the sacrifice would include two bulls, a ram, and seven male lambs. So seven times 12, another 84. You're looking at about what? 800... 800 or so lambs, 800 plus lambs, and that's just lambs. Then you have the sin offering of a goat. And then three times, and that's just the priest doing that. Okay? But three times a year, every male head of household was to offer a sacrifice in proportion to how God had blessed his family. To cover his family's sins. To wash away what was done already. And that is a lot of blood. Why? Why was blood so necessary? Because the scripture tells us that the life is in the blood. Without blood, there is no life. So the blood that is offered covers our sins. And that's what was normal. Can you imagine three times a year packing up your kids, making the spam musubis and the mochiko chicken for the, the hall, and then walking over to Waimea Bay to offer your sacrifices? Three times a year, every year. And that was normal. That's what life consisted of back then. Why? Because the sacrifices covered us so that we could approach God or they could approach God and they could be in a relationship with God. Does that sound ridiculous? Well, think about it this way. The animal sacrifices for the Hebrews would be as normal as our modern-day ritualistic offering at Starbucks. Right? How many, of you need, how many of you need your caffeine fix in the morning to be normal? To be okay? Well, that's what the, the, the blood sacrifices were. That allowed them to be presentable to God and to be in right relationship with God. Some of us can't have any meetings with anybody until we have our sacrifices. Sacrifice to the, that green sea siren goddess, whatever, Right? Those of you who don't drink Starbucks, I, I can understand. It's okay. <laughs> See, but instead of removing awareness of sin, when those animal sacrifices were repeated over and over, they actually heightened the awareness and guilt. The plain fact is that bull and goat blood can't get rid of sin. 
See, God's plan wasn't for the Hebrews to offer sacrifices forever. It was only an intermediary step. Let me finish off with verse 9 and 10. So he, God, set aside the first. What is the first? The law, the sacrificial system. In order to enact the new plan, God's way, by which we are made fit for God by once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. See, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Why did Jesus die on a cross? To fulfill the old plan, the contract, the covenant with his blood. Why would he need to do that? Well, in our society today, we're so prone to, to, um, we're a litigious society. We're so prone to suing one another for every little um, break of contract. Think about it that way. Or those of us, or I don't have a mortgage, so I'm not bound by that. But those of you who have mortgages, if you, if you default on your mortgage, what's going to happen? The bank is going to come and collect. Same thing with this covenant, with this contract with God. God made a contract with the Hebrews. It's, it's a poor choice of word, but that's the closest thing. Let's say God, the closest word we have today would be marriage. Okay? God married the Hebrews. The Hebrews violated that marriage. The Hebrews committed adultery and they just played the harlot. And, but God being God chose to fulfill the obligation of that broken marriage, that broken contract. And he did so. He paid for it with his son's blood on a cross. And by doing that, Jesus instituted a new covenant, a new plan that no longer required animal sacrifices because, again, he is the perfect sacrifice. And that sacrifice that I'm talking about was of the lamb in the book of Exodus when God led the Israelites out of Egypt. On the 10th plague, God gave the people the instructions to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood and cover it, paint their doorposts with the blood. So as the angel of death came by, the angel would pass over their particular residence. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. As John declared, the, John the Baptist declared in the Gospel of John. And then the Apostle John declares in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6, then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. This is the Apostle John professing what he saw when he was taken to heaven in the throne room of God. Jesus Christ was our high priest, is our high priest, and chose to be that sacrificial lamb for us. And that's why Jesus died. The theological term used is substitutionary atonement. But why did Jesus die on the cross for us? There's a reference in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. And that reference, it's also in our bulletins, where it says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That reference is to the story in Numbers chapter uh, 21. After the Israelites escaped from Egypt, 
and they wandered in the desert, they just complained and grumbled. And in their complaining, God sent serpents or snakes to kill off all the grumblers. Actually, not just the grumblers. Everyone who got bitten pretty much died. So the Israelites wised up, and they realized, "Uh uh-oh, we've sinned against God. So they went to Moses and said, please, please intercede for us. Go to God and make amends. So God gave Moses the instructions to to formulate a bronze serpent and put it on a stick and raise it up. And whoever looked at the bronze serpent would be healed. Doesn't that kind of sound absurd? That why would you look at a bronze serpent, God, in order for me to be healed by a snake bite? Well, we believe that the Son of Man, the creator of the heavens and the earth, was lifted up on a cross for us. It's just as absurd as looking at a bronze snake to the world. The world looks at us and says, you guys are absurd. But we who believe, we who put our faith in Christ who was lifted up, have eternal life. And that's our faith that we get to hold on to. So what do we do with this information? You know, because at this point, it's just information. We look at Jesus. We look to him for our forgiveness. As the Hebrew lights looked to the bronze serpent that was lifted up, we need to look to Jesus for our forgiveness. Because as I said earlier, we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But as we look to Jesus, we shall be healed. And then we are to live victoriously in that relationship with Christ. And yes, it is difficult to do. I understand that. And I can see some of you right now feeling the weight of that, of whatever it is you're going through. Because each of us are going through something. But the good news is that Jesus is victorious. And because he died on the cross for our sins, we don't have to. And we can stand firm with him. So I want to close in a moment of prayer to give you an opportunity to search your hearts, to come before Jesus and consecrate yourself again to him. To praise him and thank him for this gift of life that we have. But also to seek his Holy Spirit. To seek the power that he's promised us because he has promised us. Why would we be here if we don't believe in that promise? We need to stand firm and live in that promise. And we do so with the accountability of the body. So if you would bow your hearts as well as your heads with me. And take a moment as we come before the Lord to pray. Lord, I'll be the first to admit that I have sinned against you and against um, my fellow brothers and sisters in the world. I thank you for your conviction, which draws me closer to you. I thank you that you say that there is no condemnation in Christ. And for those who live in Christ Jesus, and I choose to do so, I thank you that you don't give up on me or my brothers and sisters here, but in your power, we are being transformed from glory to glory into the image of your son. And Lord, that's why we're here, because we truly believe that's what's happening to us. And Lord, we also take this time to just intercede for our family and our friends, our co-workers, those whom you put on our hearts. We intercede for their salvation, that they would be right with you, Lord. We also intercede for all the, the requests for healing, Lord, healing physically, being healed of cancer. That's what we need, Lord. 
other physical ailments of diabetes, of strokes, of brain surgeries, of other surgeries. We just lift up all these prayers to you. We pray for your peace as we age, Lord. Sometimes it's tough waking up in the mornings. I truly understand that. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are are physically in pain. We pray that your grace would be sufficient and would comfort them. We pray for your Holy Spirit to just fill fill us afresh. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen.